Okay, great. Uh, first of all, uh, NDC Porto, welcome. I wish you a warm welcome to today's talk. Thank you so much for coming today. It is my first time in Porto, and I just love it here. It's an amazing city, it's so beautiful. The weather could be better, but okay. Somebody had to make that joke, right? But it's getting better, it's getting better, so let's look at the sunny side of life. Uh, today we're going to talk about something called loading web performance. But before we do that, we need to take a small step back and ask some critical questions before we start doing some work. Now, me as an engineer, I like to know why I'm doing something, right? It gives me some kind of a sense and purpose and whatever. Let me see how many of you uh, have read the book from Simon Sinek, Start With Why? Okay, some of you. Uh, okay, uh, do you care maybe to uh, share some of the experiences or some take takeaways from that book? Please go ahead, we're amongst friends. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Thank you so much for that. You weren't prepared, but it's always some kind of a surprise with me, so... <laughs> but, but it wasn't that hard, right? It, it's all cool, right? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, great. So basically, yes, that was also one of my main takeaways from that book. If we know why we are doing something, uh, we have a purpose, we are much more motiv motivated to do something, and it's higher chance to do s some work properly, right? So if we look up to the internet, Google a little bit, why performance matters, we can find these information. and this information, and this information. I don't know about you, but this seems really convincing to me. Why should we do performance? OK, now that we are properly motivated, a little energizer right at the beginning, we go to our next question, critical questions. How can we measure it? Luckily for us, the Google invented some objective metrics to do so, called Core Web Vitals. Let me see how many of you have heard or used Core Web Vitals in your everyday work. Okay, some of you. So we're gonna, going to go through some, uh, there are many uh, Core Vitals, but we're going to mention only the basic one. There is a, a LCP, Largest Contentful Paint, which is basically for the loading stuff. There is a first input delay for the interactivity. Once you click a button, how well your web application responds to that event. Uh, we're soon we're going to move away from this. There, there will be a new metric, but for now it's still first input delay. And there is a cumulative layout shift, basically how stable the UI is whilst the, your application is still loading. Imagine if you're trying to click a button, but then section above loads some data and moves the content uh, away from that click. So basically, that metric uh, describes that. Now, the next question is where to look. If we go to our web application and we type in the URL our domain, we fetch the, from the server, we fetch the, uh, some static files. In that static files, there is index.html. In that uh, index.html, there are some links for the CSS and JavaScript. We download those files, and we can say that is the loading performance. And there we can do some optimization, like watch out for the size of those files, try to deliver those files geographically closer to, to the user, um, reduce latency, and so, so, so forth. Um, once that uh, those files are downloaded, there is, a, of course, JavaScript. JavaScript is a very special kind of a file. So basically, uh, 100 kilobytes of text and one 100 kilobytes of JavaScript is not the same, because browser needs to go through that file, parse, compiles, execute that file. So 
it, we need still to do some other things. And there is a rendering performance. Once we get HTML and CSS, browser needs to figure out, OK, how do we go from this code to the pixels on the screen? And there is that, that part of the, of the whole process. Why we are talking today about loading web performance and not the other two, it's because it's the most important one. If we do, do correctly things for the loading performance, as a total side effect, we're going to improve the performance of the other two. So we don't have to watch out for the other two that much in most of the circumstances. Like I said, uh, loading performance is getting those files, optimizing getting those files over the network. Um, but that fetching can be uh, slow and expensive. And it highly depends on your internet speed, uh, the size of those files, location of the server, uh, request round trips. We might go multiple times to the server to fetch some data, and so on. And user devices. Not everybody has the same powerful device, so we need to do some optimizations there. And that is what we are going to talk about today. Before we do that, I will quickly introduce myself. Uh, when I was in high school, I always wanted to study psychology. Now I work my dream job at Vega IT, based in Novi Sad, Serbia, where I teach people uh, soft skills. I teach them how to communicate with the clients, how to deal with uh, estimates, with deadlines, uh, how to do public speaking, obviously. <laughs> uh, and also, of course, I work on a project as a software engineer. My name is Nikola Mitrovic, and these are secret shortcuts of loading web performance for you for today. Now, before we move to the examples, obviously, I'm going to show some code. Uh, I understand that people in the back might not see the, the code. So if you're having troubles, you can scan this QR and follow the presentation along. You can put it in a landscape mode and follow along, but of course, uh, the people up front can save this uh, as a reference. That's one thing. The second thing is the examples I'm, going uh, I'm about to show you are written in React, simply because I'm most comfortable with the ecosystem of React. I work on a project as a React developer. Of course, I've worked uh, Angular and Vue.js before that. But if you're not doing React, or you're not familiar with the ecosystem that much, Please take, um, um, take uh, attention to, to the concepts, because these concepts we're about to cover are easily applicable to Angular and Vue.js or Svelte or whatever you're doing. OK? OK, let's move on. I'm going to jump straight, straight to the point and say that the JavaScript is the biggest bottleneck of the loading web performance. Large bundle sizes will, will cause some problems. And they can cause problems during the loading, the rendering, user interaction, page scroll, basically anything. It affects almost all web vitals. And it's the biggest bottleneck. Uh, of course, I found some like a case study of one of the applications uh, which produced, uh, produced uh, these kinds of results. Of course, for you, it doesn't have to be that way. But you can see that the JavaScript takes uh, the most effect on the performance stuff. OK, how to optimize the JavaScript? We could minify it. We could compress it with gzip and broadly. We could remove some unused code, code with tree shaking. We could analyze the bundle size with some tools with the help of Webpack Analyzer. There are some other tools these days. We can use Visual Studio Code plugin, which is called Import Cost, which gives you the cost of your import, the size of the import you're trying to import in your code. And there is a very cool we website called Bundle Phobia. So I'm going to show you uh, the Bundle Phobia. Uh, if you type let's say, some of the classics like uh, moment.js, we can see that it's, that library is very, very big. Uh, it takes a lot of time to, to be downloaded. And what's cool about bundle phobia 
it also gives you some alternatives. So it gives you some similar packages that you may use, uh, which are basically doing the same thing. Also, one of the most common te techniques is code splitting. So we don't have to ship a huge bundle, one bundle of JavaScript into our browsers. We could split it into multiple chunks. And the way to do that in React is commonly used technique is route-based code, code splitting. So for example, we have a component. We present that component on a route, but we could use dynamic import, which will basically split that part, that component, into a separate bundle. And once we go to that route, it will be loaded. Right? That's all if we Google a little bit and use some common techniques. But uh, then again, we have to ask a question. What if we do all of this, and it's still not enough? Let's go to this example. Uh, here in this example, we have a small application which has some uh, three sections. And I know that this third section has a performance bottleneck. How can we detect that? If we go to our dev tools and go to the Lighthouse, uh, let me see how many of you have used Lighthouse. OK, most of you, so you're familiar with the tool. Let's run the initial load performance with Lighthouse for this app and see what happens. It's going to take some time because I know there is a bottleneck there. Waiting just a bit more. Here it comes. OK, not so great for the application that has only three components. How can we interpret these numbers in the Lighthouse? Can anybody tell me why is this number going red and not the LCP, since we're talking about loading web performance? Anybody has an idea? No? OK. It's because I just wrote all a, a million times in the console, and it blocked the main thread. But what if we can um, offload that third component into a separate bundle? We load only first two components that are initially most important for the user. And then we load the third component once we scroll a little bit, and the second section is visible. So it's like a preparation for loading of that uh, component. Um, if we go to the network, in this example, we, we can see that all, the, all of the code is in the one same bundle. But here, if we refresh the application and scroll a bit down, then we can see that we loaded that code splitter bundle, which is the third component. We offloaded the initial load. OK, let's see now what are, OK, this is the uh, my test from the before, but just uh, we're clear that there are no tricks or I'm not trying to deceive you or anything. Let's check it again. Cool. Amazing. So how did, we, how did we do this? There is a technique that is not so commonly known that is called component-based lazy loading. So we can also code split a certain component and then uh, isolate performance issues uh, in that component. Also, it needs to go into the dynamic import like before. But in th this time, as you recall, we had the logic, OK, when the second section is visible, then trigger, then show that component. So we put a reference on a, on a second section. And then we have a, a hook called use visible, which basically figures out if the second section is visible on the screen or, or not, once we scroll a, a bit. Once we do that, we trigger a flag is visible, and then we show the third component, which will be dynamically or loaded on demand, if you will. Also, what could also be a secret shortcut is that we reduce the number of lips. Shockingly, there is a lib called is odd, uh, sorry, is even, but this might come as a surprise to you. 
there is also is odd library, which has um, almost half a million weekly downloads. I don't know why anybody <laughs> would do this. And uh, to be frank with you, I'm a little bit scared to know why. <laughs> I don't want to know. Please don't tell me any anywhere. Um, also, in the previous example that we have seen, there is a component called use, uh, there is a hook called use visible. Under the hood of that hook, uh, if you might uh, thought that it's a library, it's actually our custom code, and it relies on, on a web API that is called Intersection Observer. So if we use the functionality that is provided by the platform, by our browsers, by the JavaScript itself, then we would need to use less, less libraries, uh, much less, and that would pr uh, produce a smaller bundle size of JavaScript. OK, let's move to images. What about images? If we Google a little bit, we can find out that we can take advantage of the ne next generation formats, but we need to watch out for the support for these formats. We could use image tag over background image. This is not going to do anything specifically for the performance, but it is going to give us more control over what we can do with the images and how we load images by creating responsive images. Uh, we can do that by setting a uh, source set attribute uh, and combine it with the sizes attribute. So basically, we tell our browsers, OK, if, uh, if you are on mobile, download the smaller, smaller version of the image, because the bigger uh, the image, uh, uh, the, bi the bigger uh, image in pixels, the, it will be the bigger size of, a, of an image. Uh, we can load key images with a fetch priority, so it's like a hint from a browser, OK, load these images first and defer the other ones later. Or we can use the reverse logic, so we can set uh, async attribute and load some images asynchronously. And of course, we can compress images. I don't know about you, but I've used some kind of tools. Uh, do you know some, some tools for compressing images? like Tiny Panda or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Great. But again, what if we do all of this and it's still not enough? So let's go to our second example for today. What if we have this picture of a galaxy and it's, we did all the previous steps and it's still just too big because it's a picture in a higher resolution? And we're experiencing some network issues. OK, let's refresh this and see what happens. OK. Let me see. How many of you would say this was an awesome user experience? OK, great, amazing. Thank you, sir. You are a much better person than I am. <laughs> but since most of the people are not so kind as you, we need to do better. What if we can do the previous example like this? If we try to refresh it, we show the low quality image right at the beginning. And then we let the high resolution picture load in the background. Once it's loaded, it, we smoothly transition uh, over the, the showing the, the higher resolution picture. How can we do this? There is a very cool pattern called progressive image loading or low quality image placeholder. And it basically works like this. We have a, that image of, of a galaxy at first, but then we have a Pro image, uh, which accepts that uh, high resolution image and a fallback that we just seen. How many of you think that this is a library? Okay. Why, why do you think that, if I may ask? Mm, okay, yeah. yeah. That is correct. I'm importing it from somewhere, so it's kind of a component. Uh, OK, we'll, we'll see. 
but it's my component, it's custom component, and it's ridiculously easy to create a component like this, and I'm going to show you how. Uh, so we have a state, like image is loaded, meaning that higher, uh, higher resolution image. If it's loaded or not, initially it's not, of course, and if it's not, we show the fallback image immediately. But then in the background, uh, it's kind of a, like a visual trick. Uh, the bigger picture is hidden underneath the, the smaller resolution picture just to trigger the download of that high resolution picture. And there is an attribute on the HTML uh, of the image tag, which is called onload. Once that, uh, that event will be triggered, once the full resolution image is downloaded. Once we do that, we just switch the state and we show the full resolution image, and that's it. OK, what about data? When we are dealing with the front end, often we uh, are communicating with a back end, and that data can be sometimes huge in a payload. We can reduce that by leveraging GraphQL, so we just pick from that payload what we need. Or we can prefetch data by using uh, the link tag, and there is a rel attribute with a preload value and with a, with a URL to the, to the API. But again, what if we do all of this and we're still not getting the results that we might have or might want? OK. Now we move to, to our next example. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to explain a bit, uh, give you the context uh, about this app. This app is called svemirko.rs. Roughly tra translated to English, it means spaceman. And it's a little bit futuristic app, a few thousands years in the future, where you can go and uh, uh, pick a vacation to uh, some exoplanet. In the back end, we're communicating with the NASA's API, which is retrieving us that list. But as we can see by the time of that request, if somebody knows somebody from NASA, please tell, tell them this, uh, that request might take really long. And we want to preload that data as soon as possible. There are two common patterns for this. So for example, we can immediately preload all the data for other pages. but uh, in this case, we did it on a hovering on the link. So it's like kind of like a hint from a user, hey, I'm about to go to the next page. Prepare me the data as soon as you can. So if we now click that link, we can see the list of those planets. And then we can search and pick uh, where to go to the vacation. For example, uh, TOI5542B. Sounds amazing, Al always wanted to go there, cool. And then I can go and reserve my flight. Uh, also, we may notice that if we go back and forth, the data is immediately there. So it's kind of like cached or something like that. Let's see how we did we pull this off. Uh, we can prefetch data by this awesome hook called use SWR, made by Vercel. So we had that link component, that, like a button. Once we hover over that button, then we trigger a request to the NASA's API. And then we call a mute function from SWR to cache that data. In the component that is on the other page that is showing the list of the planets, we access uh, the config from SWR, and there is a cache. And we can get that cache by accessing the same key that we stored uh, that data while, we'll, while we were fetching those data. Um, and then we can iterate through that list and show the, all the planets. Notice that this component is not doing any request. It's not fetching data. It's not communicating, communicating with an API. Uh, the data for this component is immediately there. Um, OK. OK, uh, since we are ma mentioning caching, caching is also a very powerful me mechanism for the performance stuff, um, since it will store some data in the cache, and we might not go uh, multiple round trips to fetch those data. It eliminates network latency. 
it only affects safe HTTP methods like get. Uh, it doesn't work for the mutation methods. And we can do this by leveraging cache control headers. There are some no store, meaning never store cache. No cache, meaning uh, stores uh, data in the cache, but always check with the origin server for those data. There is a maximum age. Until the certain point in time, you cache this data. And there is a very cool header called stale while revalidate. Ringing any bells for this one? Yes? Please go ahead. Ah, OK. What were your experiences? You? Ah, OK, OK, sorry. I was referring to the previous example uh, because first letters S, W, R. That's why the name of the hook from, from the before. OK, there is a pattern called content addressable storage pattern. Uh, anybody heard of this one? Use this one? Uh, OK, I will quickly show you that because uh, we have seen that uh, uh, while we are uh, loading, loading the file, a JavaScript file. So basically, when we say main dot some hash dot js, that uh, hash is like a ID for that file. So the server knows uh, if we have a new build for a JavaScript file, if that hash changes. If it doesn't change, then we don't need to go to the server and download the very same JavaScript file. If it changes, then go fetch a new version of the, of the library, uh, of the app, sorry. But the problem with cache is that we have very limited control over it. How can we improve this? By leveraging service workers. Uh, how many of you have heard or used service workers? OK, some of you, great. Uh, so service worker is basically a proxy between a browser and network, interceptor, if you will, uh, which gives us uh, more programmatic control over a cache. So we can uh, go and uh, create a service worker and type some kind of a logic when and how we want to cache some data. It gives us, of course, offline cap capabilities, and we can see some performance gains. And there are a bunch of scenarios. Uh, I put the link there uh, to an awesome resource that uh, even Kyle Simpson showed in his uh, workshops and presentations. So it's a very, very cool because it shows you all different kinds of scenarios. How can you leverage uh, service workers? And of course, since we're we were talking about data and the round trips to the server. Imagine like this. Uh, we're fetching a JavaScript file, which is a code for some component. Then browser needs to parse and execute that file. Then we figure out, OK, there is a link or HTTP call to the server for this component. But we might know that at build time, right? So there is a pattern called server-side rendering where we uh, pre-calculate some data on the server, generate uh, an HTML out of it, and then we ship it to the browser, and browser immediately, immediately shows the content uh, of that component. And yes, and then in the background, we uh, do a pattern called progressive hydration, where we download the JavaScript uh, for those elements uh, once we want to interact uh, with those elements. These days, uh, in React ecosystem, uh, probably two, two most popular ones are Next and Remix, which have some similar features. Uh, of course, they, are, they have a lot of differences, but that would require uh, a separate talk probably for that. But why they are so awesome is because they leverage a concept called edge computing. Now, edge computing means it's like a CDN for server-side data. So for example, if we have one server in America, all users would need to go to that server and uh, to get those server-side data. But what Next.js and Remix are doing is that they are spread uh, their application. They convert our application 
into serverless Lambda functions. They spread uh, our application geographically across the world, and then they hydrate uh, the server-side data. So really cool, really amazing. And also, uh, these days, is very popular idea about zero kilobytes JavaScript frameworks. And we have uh, two most recent ones. Uh, it's Quick and server-side components. Now, on the first day, we had an awesome talk from Aurora about server-side components. So now we know everything about server-side components and how to use them. And also, there is a very cool framework called Quick, uh, which basically uh, is, is like, a, it's like a pull mechanism. So server-side rendering is like a push mechanism because we push JavaScript in the background and we hydrate uh, HTML that we generated previously, but this is like a pull mechanism. So we uh, lazy load everything. The whole application is lazily loaded, and those uh, small chunks for each part of the application is preloaded. And then we only use those chunks on interactivity. So we only use the part of the JavaScript once we need it, once we need it and not before that. The side effect of this zero kilobyte JavaScript and loading performance of 100% on Lighthouse. So really cool, really awesome. Uh, and they uh, rely on the concept called resumability because uh, you preload everything, you have all the code in the background, you load only what you need when you need it. And if you don't do anything and you continue, you just resume with the previous activity and even you have a state uh, management for that and re re really cool stuff. And now we come to our highlight of today's talk. Uh, we go, uh, and now I'm going to show you the best performance hack ever. Uh, and I want everybody to use this and every, in everyday work and, and everyday job. Basically, you just put a delay uh, on each uh, important function uh, in, in your application. And since we are JavaScript developers, uh, we put a timeout. And once there is a problem reported, you just move that timer away, and everybody is going to love you. Your boss is, getting, is going to give you a raise. Clients are going to be delighted by you, how awesome you are as an engineer. So. Yeah, thank you. Uh, follow me more for uh, follow me for more uh, career advices <laughs> like this. Okay, a little joke at the end, but for the very end, we're going to be a little bit serious again. Uh, with great power come great comes great responsibility. Anybody knows who said this? Anybody a fan of Marvel? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, sorry. It wasn't that cool, yeah? Yes, Uncle Ben from Spider-Man said this. Uh, I, today I got this kind of a power, uh, so I felt it's like my responsibility to come here and say this. I wanted to talk about our planet. Okay. I see some of the 404 not found faces. <laughs> like, what? How, how our planet has to do with our code? Well, it does. We write our awesome web application. We run a bundle. The outcome of that bundle is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files, right? We ship and deploy those files to some cloud provider. That cloud provider has servers distributed across the world, a lot of servers, a lot of data centers. In those data centers are basically like a bunch of computers plugged in into electricity. And in fact, so much we use so much electricity that it is, it is this high. I don't know about you, but this sounds really uh, staggering to me uh, to find out that we are polluting our planet by uh, not being careful enough uh, the, about the bundle sizes of our apps and how many code we ship to, to the servers. Luckily for us, there is an awesome app called Website Carbon Calculator, which basically figures out 
how green your website or web application is. So let's go to a quick demo. Uh, you know about can see dots, right? Uh, one of my favorite instructor instructors and authors out there. So let's check his website. So let's just type the URL and see what's going on. We can see that uh, website Carbon Calculator gives you messages that are very cool uh, while it's ca calculating. Uh, stuff and okay, we can see that this website is pretty much green. Uh, it only em emits a small amount of CO2, and it's basically sustainable. Uh, we can even see some statistics. Okay, two trees need to do their work per year to support this website. Uh, so if your site is in the red red zone, please uh, go ahead and fix that. And I'm going to end with this. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Our planet is our home. We only have one home. If we go wrong about this, there's no going back. When I was building Svemirko.rs, I was much more thinking like in that Dua Lipa song, you know, that if you want to run away with me, I know a galaxy and I can take you for a ride much more than Interstellar the movie. So let's be kind to our planet. Let's be kind to our home. Because if we don't, if we choose not to, well, then one day, one day might be too late. Thank you so much for coming today. You, you have been awesome. Thank you. Um, any questions, maybe? No? Okay, this is the link, again, to the presentation itself. So if you want to recap, revisit, if you want to talk with me about the performance, I'm going to be right there in front. There is a link to my GitHub, so you can check out the code, uh, all the examples that I've showed you, and you can try them for yourselves. and. Maybe give me a, a, a comment on a PR or something like that. So please go ahead. Ah, uh, Vilodora. Uh,